Um, got my screen sharing here. So, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to uh, the, the Crow Canyon webinar series here. Uh, today we're with Mark Varian, uh, right here out of Crow Canyon. And my name is Kellum Throgmorton. I think a lot of you know me, I'm the field director here. Uh, Mark is the director of, of the Research Institute of Crow Canyon. Uh, Mark currently serves as the executive vice president of the Research Institute, excuse me. Uh, and in this position, he works with Crow Canyon staff and associates to increase knowledge of the human experience through archaeological research, uh, to conduct that research in the context of public education programs, and partner with American Indians on the design and delivery of those research and education programs. Mark's first research in the Mesa Verde region occurred in 1979, and he joined the Crow Canyon staff in 1987. Uh, he received a BA and an MA from the University of Texas in Austin and his PhD from Arizona State University. And so for today, we're going to be talking, Mark's going to be talking about work that he's done with the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office uh, on a project, uh, a comprehensive maze database uh, for Colorado and the greater Southwest. But I want to give you a little bit of background on Crow Canyon, just in case this is the first time you're joining us. I know a lot of you are uh, repeat offenders here, uh, but just in case. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache, people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Um, our mission-related work would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, the present, and the future. Uh, we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. So Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Crow Canyon's mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Uh, you can find out more about us at crowcanyon.org. Uh, the website's recently been revamped, so it's worth stopping in and taking a look. And we're actually always working on, uh, on keeping things updated. So I think in the coming weeks and months, you can expect to see some new things uh, showing up there as well. Now, if you're not super familiar with Zoom, there's a couple things you can do here. Uh, first of all, you can move the talking heads. You're probably seeing me uh, and maybe me, Mark, and, and Taylor uh, somewhere in the upper part of your screen or upper left, but you can click the view setting and you can change the size of those heads. You can move where I am around to make sure that you can see everything on a slide. If you can't read all the, te all the text, feel free to move the, uh, the talking heads out of the way there. Uh, there is a live transcription service. It looks like it's kicked on uh, right about now. The one thing I'll let you know is that it often struggles with words that aren't in English and with archaeological terminology. So uh, take it with a grain of salt at times because you're going to see some funny words come across there. Uh, you can ask questions for the presenter, for Mark, by using the Q&A function. And you'll find that there should be a little taskbar that shows up either at the bottom or the top of your screen for, for most people's configuration. Um, and that's for questions about the content of the webinar. Uh, if you're just trying to interact with other people that you happen to see as participants and uh, attendees, you can do that through the chat function. If you're having difficulties with this on Zoom, uh, we're also uh, live casting this. There's a live stream on our Facebook page, uh, crocanion.org slash Facebook. And uh, I do believe this is one that will be recorded and placed on YouTube after uh, the webinar is done. So you can uh, come back and check in on that uh, at some point down the road. Uh, I always like to tell people to, to like and subscribe on, on YouTube. It does open up different functionality for us uh, as an organization, allows us to have access to a wider audience uh, for the kinds of things that we like to talk about here at Crow Canyon. I wanna let you know about a couple upcoming webinars. Uh, these are actually gonna be pretty exciting. Uh, so, first of all, coming up next week, next Thursday, uh, we have a just transition with Winona LaDuke. Um, Winona LaDuke, uh, many of you might be familiar with her work uh, in activist circles over the last several, let's say a couple of decades. Uh, she's from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota, and she's going to be speaking about the, and how indigenous knowledge can help inform a transition from fossil fuels. I think that one's going to be really excellent. We feel really honored to have uh, uh, gotten her here on the webinar series. So that's something to really look forward to. 
And then uh, it's a little out of sequence, but on Tuesday, Tuesday, mark your calendars there, different than our normal day, Tuesday, November 9th, uh, we're going to have the cartoonist and artist Ricardo Cate, who is from Santa Domingo Pueblo in New Mexico, uh, talking about art and activism. Um, and uh, Mr. Cate's cartoons certainly get wide circulation in the four corners in the greater Southwest. I think they do occasionally make it further afield as well. Um, just a really great sense of wit and um, also how you convey important messages, uh, important social messages and messages of activism uh, through a few short panels of artwork. Uh, so that's also one to look forward to. That's gonna be great too. We wanna make people aware of places where they can help out. There's a lot of communities in need in this part of the world, this part of the country. Uh, and so here on this slide, I've got a, a list of several places where you can make donations that go directly to helping uh, Pueblo and, and Navajo families and communities. There's the Pueblo Relief Fund, uh, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, uh, and the official Navajo Nation COVID-19 relief fund. So uh, we are getting to that time of the year where people are starting to think about what kind of donations they're gonna make uh, as they're closing out the balance books. These are a couple of great places to consider uh, if you're looking for a way to make a difference and places to make donations. So without further ado, I believe I'm going to turn things over here to Dr. Mark Varian. I've already given a bit of an introduction to him, uh, the official one. I'll give the unofficial one here now just to say it's a real pleasure to be. Uh, I'm not sure I've actually hosted the webinar. Uh, Mark's just been a, a real great influence in, in my career, and I owe a lot to him. So also, thank you, Mark. I'm a, I appreciate what you've done and continue to do for all of us here at Crow Canyon. Well, thank you so much, Kellum. I really appreciate you uh, moderating the webinar tonight. So I'm gonna begin to see if I can share my screen. And as you share your screen, Mark, if you wanna just go ahead and select uh, optimize for video sharing and share sound. Too late, I already pulled it up. I'll start over, okay? Um, so thank you for that reminder. I told you I'd forget. That's what I'm here for. Okay, it looks like they're clicked. So I think I'm good. Awesome, you're coming through clear. Great. Well, thanks to everybody who's tuning in tonight. Um, I noticed in the chat, William Doolittle had a really nice comment and uh, we've never met, but Mr. Doolittle, Dr. Doolittle has uh, been studying native and uh, agriculture for decades more than me. So it's an honor to have you out there in the crowd tonight. Uh, I am Mark Varian, and uh, Kellum gave you the details on me. I first came to this part of the world to do archaeology in 1979, and then I joined Crow Canyon in 1987, so it's been a huge and wonderful part of my life. I'm going to be giving an update on a project we're currently working on but haven't yet completed, so it's an update. It's called the Maze Database Project, and it's funded by History Colorado State Historical Fund and by Crow Canyon. And we're so lucky in Colorado to have this grant opportunity uh, that Crow Canyon has participated in for a couple decades now and has been critical to us uh, doing our projects over the years. So um, uh, learn more about History Colorado and the State Historical Fund and be sure to give it your support. This project, the Maze Database Project, was co-designed by Crow Canyon and the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office under the leadership of Stuart Koyiyumptua, and that's Stuart and I in this photo. Our colleague Kyle Basinski actually was the lead author on the grant proposal to SHF, so I want to be sure and call him out. And this, this webinar that I'm doing tonight is really a team effort, and I want to acknowledge a number of people who helped with this presentation uh, where I'm going to be the presenter, but they did a lot of the work behind the scenes. Uh, first is Paul Ermagiotti, who created many of the images uh, that you'll see in this presentation and who's been a key player on both the Pueblo Farming Project and the Maze Database Project. Um, Reed Brueger is a Crow Canyon volunteer who works with us on both the PFP, which is short for the Pueblo Farming Project, and the Maze Database Project. And he's, he does many different uh, important work uh, as a part of that. But he's a person who took many of the photos that you'll see and who shot most of the videos that I'm going to play tonight. 
There are a few videos that aren't reads and they're by uh, filmmaker Chris Simon, uh, who's really an uh, excellent filmmaker. And uh, she's the person who made the documentary, a documentary film that I'll mention at one point in the talk. Those were larger videos and it was Laura Brown from Crow Canyon staff who edited the videos to get them uh, to the size that they are uh, for use in this presentation. My colleague Grant Coffey uh, helped with technical issues and the Maze database team helped. The project is really a team effort and I'm gonna talk about them individually later in this talk. Finally, I wanna thank Taylor Hasbrook who's runs the webinars behind the scenes and makes them work so uh, seamlessly. So apologies to anybody I've left out, but I wanna thank all of those people. So I'm gonna begin uh, talking about the uh, Pueblo farming project and uh, good, that advanced. Um, with, because uh, this project has a longer history and the maize database project grew out of the PFP. Uh, the Pueblo Farming Project was another collaboration with the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office, and its most basic goal is to better understand Pueblo maize or corn farming, past and present. And in this talk tonight, I'll use those two words interchangeably, uh, maize and corn. The uh, PFP was... Um, the PFP was... Um, initiated during a consultation meeting in 2005 at Hopi. And we were actually con consulting on a project that we wanted to start um, a research project here at Crow Canyon in partnership with the National Park Service. And before we did that project, we needed to consult with the tribes first. So we went down to Hopi and we spent probably close to two hours talking about the Goodman Point archeological project. But when we were done, I asked, uh, I asked the Hopi Cultural Preservation staff that was there if there were other things besides what we went over for the Goodman Point project that Hopi wanted us to research. And this man, Lee Kuanwisiwama, who was the uh, director of the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office at the time, and who is my good friend and just amazing colleague, uh, he didn't hesitate for a second. He immediately said corn and corn farming. And he did this because corn is so important to Hopi people and Hopi culture and to the other Pueblos uh, and their societies. So I'm gonna play a video that Laura compiled from a longer video with other people in it, but that just has Lee's voice uh, talking about corn and corn farming and its importance to Hopi people. Corn is a gift to the Hopi people and it's our symbol of, of being Hopi. Corn, of course, became part of the culture. Growing up into the corn culture, you just basically learn that if you respect the environment and the earth, then both will help you with what you have to do to survive, which is the corn. It forces you to submit to nature. You have no control over the environment, except that you, through perhaps your own personal teachings or through ceremony, corn represented uh, humility. We carry cornmeal everywhere. So if we even take some flowers, you know, or pick some wild spinach, we all, always put cornmeal to reciprocate, to back to the plant, back to the earth. Corn is a gift to the so you get a sense uh, from that video, although what we've learned in our partnership with the Pueblos is just how deep this relationship with corn goes. And it's, it's something that we as non-Pueblo people uh, continue to learn uh, and appreciate to the best of our abilities, but probably never fully understand this uh, profound relationship. Um, so Lee asked us to, study corn and corn farming, but in that meeting, we didn't decide how. So I came back to um, uh, Crow Canyon, and I had to write a grant uh, to fund a meeting that was held at Crow Canyon um, to ask that question of Pueblo people. How should we study corn and corn farming? Most of the people who attended that meeting, which are shown in that 
photograph on the top um, were from a variety of Pueblos. They were joined by several Crow Canyon staff members and by three Anglo uh, people who have uh, in their lives worked with Pueblo farmers to better understand Pueblo uh, agriculture. So in this photo from left to right, that's Margie Conley, formerly uh, of Crow Canyon, uh, Kevin Shendo of Jemez Pueblo next to her. I'm in the cowboy hat in the back next to Kevin. In front of me is John Romero from Jemez. Uh, behind him is Grant Coffey from Crow Canyon. Uh, in front of Grant and next to John Romero is uh, Tom Lucero of, uh, of Jemez. Uh, Tom's no longer with us. Uh, can't express what an incredible fine person he was and the contribution he made to this project. Uh, behind him that you can barely see, that's uh, Louis Haina from Tasuki Pueblo. In front of him, but still in the back, is uh, Wilton Kuyahoma -ho uh, from Hopi. Uh, next to him is Harold Polinyamtiwa from Hopi. Behind Harold is uh, Herman Agoyo from Okeawinge Pueblo. Um, in front of him is Frank Honahani from Hopi. Behind him is Kurt Onshutz, one of the people who studies Pueblo agriculture. Um, in front of Kurt is Lee Kuanwisiwama, who we saw before. Uh, in back of him is John Callender, who was working at Hopi. In front of him is uh, Bradley Balankawa holding the uh, soil auger. In back is Marvin Lalo from Hopi. And then to the left of Marvin in front is Steve Dominguez. And behind him, Dick Ford, two other prominent scholars who have studied Pueblo agriculture. So we met for two days and discussed how those that very simple question of how do we move forward to study corn and corn farming and these Pueblo farmers decided we should do two things we should start an experimental farming project in the Mesa Verde region and they also decided the the non-Hopi farmers decided that Hopi should take the lead and that's because we think much of the farming in the Mesa Verde region in the past was what we call dry farming or direct precipitation farming, where the only moisture that the crop gets is what falls from the sky. And most of the other Pueblos practice irrigation farming today, but at Hopi, the primary uh, farming is still dry farming. Um, so uh, those were the two decisions to come out of that meeting in 2006. To move this project forward, I had to write another grant uh, to bring Hopi farmers here to select the fields. We had hoped to plant fields out at good, the Goodman Point unit of the uh, Hovenweep National Monument of the National Park Service, but that didn't work out. So we, the farmers came to Crow Canyon's campus and selected locations of uh, five different fields at uh, Crow Canyon's campus, which uh, today during the course of the project, we now just plant uh, three of those gardens at uh, Crow Canyon's campus and we plant another garden further north on the farm of a, a, a farmer up near Dove Creek, uh, Mike Coffey, who is Grant Coffey's father. Um, another grant had to happen in order to bring folks back for several years to start the planting and harvesting of these gardens, but we did that for the uh, first time in uh, 2008. And, it was just a, the first planting. This is the picture when we finished the uh, first planting, uh, celebrating eating watermelon. Um, and um, it was just an amazing, wonderful start to this project. Uh, that's Ben Bellarado on the right. I haven't mentioned him. He's currently our lab director. Back then he was our lab educator. Then he left Crow Canyon and did a bunch of different things, including recently getting his PhD at Arizona, University of Arizona. And he's come back to Crow Canyon to work uh, as our lab director. But Ben actually did his master's thesis uh, on Pueblo farming. So he was an integral part in getting this started uh, as well. So uh, the Hopi provided the initial seed for our farming. Uh, and we experimented with a number of varieties uh, for the first few years. But after about three years, we settled in and just plant the blue and the white variety uh, today. So um, as I mentioned, a series of grants have made this uh, Pueblo farming project happen. And I want to acknowledge those. Again, earlier state historical fund grants were critical. Uh, National Science Foundation grant, a National Geographic Gene Gene 
Geographic Legacy Fund grant uh, and the Christensen Fund, along with Crow Canyon, have provided the financial support for this project, and we're very grateful to all of these. But we're mostly grateful to these Hopi farmers who have come up uh, uh, to help us plant, teach us how to tend, and teach us how to harvest these gardens. So these are a picture of all the different farmers that have come up. Some are members, are staff members of the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office. Um, some are a part of an uh, advisory team that advises the Cultural Preservation Office um, and the Cultural Preservation Office. Um, and some are just Hopi farmers that uh, came up to participate. Uh, so really grateful. Uh, once again, uh, several of these elders have passed on and the four in the, on the upper left, Morgan, Raleigh, Owen, and Harold uh, have all passed on, but they came up for many, many years in a row to help us with this project. And um, it's just really hard to express um, what amazing people these are uh, and the knowledge that they have about uh, uh, traditional Hopi farming about Hopi culture and just the um, just how amazing they are as people. So it's been a real, real honor uh, to work with this group of people. Um, let's see, I'm gonna show you a video next from the Pueblo Farming Project, just to give you a sample of how uh, traditional uh, Pueblo planting uh, takes place. And this is Harold and Owen uh, planting a particular clump. Oh, <laughs> There was actually a lot of subtlety in that video that you know you wouldn't catch just uh, watching it. Uh, how deep they plant to get down to where the good soil moisture is. Um, the fact that they plant about twelve seeds in each hole that they later thin to about six plants that grow in the clump. Um, the way uh, Harold put the dirt back in, you know, he didn't even think about it obviously, but putting the moistest dirt from the bottom back in first then covering that with the dry dirt on top that acts as a dust mulch. And there's more uh, subtlety to it as well that they've uh, taught us over the years. So we also do the Hopi uh, collaborators go back home and uh, Crow Canyon tends the gardens every week, uh, including tending them and doing weekly documentation. And a few people have uh, worked on that, many people, but by far the bulk of this has been done by Paul Ermagiotti, Reed Brueger, and Grant Coffey that you see in this uh, picture. And you can see on the left all the growth and reproductive stages that they record when those emerge on the plants. Uh, they record damage by insects, animals, uh, it being too dry. And, um, you know, the, one of the objectives is to record the uh, growth stage information along with the environmental information each year and determine how that affects uh, yields. So um, the one thing we've learned though, so that was sort of our interest at Crow Canyon going into this, this relationship between environment and yields. But what the Hopi experts taught us is how corn and corn farming are way more to Hopi than just food. And there's many dimensions of that, but you're gonna get a taste of it in this next video where Donald Dawahongniwa is talking to a group of Crow Canyon uh, students and telling them, and he, he begins by saying, we don't think of these as numbers. And what he's referring to is we number each crop, each clump in order to record it. And he's explaining how they don't think about it that way. They think about it differently. When we look at our, our crops, like when we're planting like this, we don't look at them, them as numbers. We look at them as our children, like you're our children. That's how we look at our plants. We treat them like that. And so when you go to your field, you sing a song, and your children will hear you, hear you sing, and they'll, they'll say, our dad is coming. Where? 
then they'll tiptoe, try to look over the horizon, and that's how they grow. And that's how you grow, right? When you see your when you see your mom or your dad come home, from work, dad is coming, you're looking up the window, right? That's how you're doing, exactly what they're doing too. Okay, and that's how we. Uh, so they really, um, as I said, there's so many dimensions to this, but uh, that's really beautiful, I think. And uh, it was really profound for us to learn this, how they think about corn as people and this relationship between parents and children. And uh, they also emphasized how the, uh, like from what they told us is more important than whether it rains or not, is what you bring to your field in your heart when you come to farm. And that's a part of singing that song when you're coming to your field too, to just make sure your heart's in the right place uh, when you get to your field. So there's been a whole bunch of, uh, the Pueblo Farming Project is more than just the planting and harvesting and measuring yields. And there's been many different outcomes that have grown uh, during the course of the project. Uh, and a big part of it is our mission here at Crow Canyon to, uh, turn the projects that we're doing also into education projects. So there's been a, at least over a dozen public presentations about the Pueblo Farming Project, including one that Paul and I did on a Crow Canyon uh, webinar last year. And you can get on Crow Canyon's YouTube and it actually goes into a lot more detail about the farming project than I'm doing tonight, but you can find that at that link or just get on Crow Canyon's YouTube page and scroll down through it and you'll find it. We've also developed uh, education curricula. Uh, Hopi educator here at Crow Canyon, uh, D uh, developed curricula. And then we partnered with a, a local group called Montezuma School to Farm that works in our local schools. And we develop five standards aligned lesson plans. And they each, each one of those five has a long 90 minute version and a shorter 45 minute version. Uh, Chris Simon, along with Shirley Powell and Margie Conley made a film about the Pueblo Farming Project. It's 28 minutes and it's called More Than Planting a Seed. And it's really wonderful. Uh, we've also produced a series of publications. And the first one on this list is worth noting because that publication reports the results of the analysis, the DNA analysis of modern Hopi corn, which was done as a part of the Pueblo Farming Project at the request of the Hopi tribe in order to document uh, the DNA of this corn that they see as them having developed over the last several thousand years. Um, and, you know, they're worried about in today's world that DNA and their varieties getting contaminated. So they wanted that background uh, knowledge. Um, well, we've also done a, a publication where we, we use the yields from the Pueblo Farming Project to compare to computer models that estimate yields of maize in the past that were done as a part of a project that Co Crow Canyon collaborated with others on, most notably Tim Kohler of Washington State University, who he and his team developed these computer models. So we were test using the, uh, the Pueblo Farming Project to test the accuracy or to evaluate the accuracy of those computer models. We have another uh, publication in press that uh, presents results from our project, but the publication I'm most proud of is the uh, ebook, uh, which is a, it's a comprehensive report on the Pueblo Farming Project published on the internet. And if you type in that link that's highlighted in blue on the top of this image uh, into your browser, this ebook will come up. And this is the title page that will come up. And you can see that Paul is the person that is the uh, lead author on this. And he actually continues to update it uh, every year with the new results from each year's uh, planting and harvesting. Although it has more than just the results of the planting and harvesting, the curricula that I mentioned before are available through this ebook. And the documentary film that I mentioned can also be accessed uh, through this ebook. So, uh, two of the most important things we did as a part of the Pueblo Farming Project were to uh, hold a community meeting uh, at Hopi, and that took place in 2019 at the Kaikotes Mavi Community Center that you see the park, the car parked in front of there. And um, uh, it was a meeting that we invited all Hopi uh, 
tribal members to. Most of them are working. We did it during the week and during the day. Uh, uh, but we still had 50 or 60 people show up. So it was really gratifying. And it was really neat because um, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office hosted a lunch where they used our corn in many of the dishes. And that's uh, Joel Nicholas in the picture on the left in the center, but his mom is to the left and she sort of coordinated uh, a group of women uh, to develop this wonderful uh, feast that we had before we made our our presentations uh, to the tribal members on this project. Then in 2020, uh, like right before everything shut down, uh, we returned uh, 250 pounds of our harvest over the years to Hopi, uh, to the Cultural Preservation Office, and they distributed it to various uh, uh, tribal members. And it was just so gratifying to uh, see how enthusiastic people were um, to uh, receive this uh, maze. Um, it was at these two meetings, the community meeting, and then when we came down to return the corn. Um, and let me back up and say, one of the things that Stuart has taught us is, so we were doing these harvests and curating these harvests in case somebody wanted to use them for future studies. And that bothered Stuart and probably other members too, because uh, Stuart would tell us that corn has a knows has a purpose and that it knows its purpose and that if it doesn't fulfill that purpose, which is to be eaten and to be used in their ceremonies, um, the phrase that Stuart uses is that it pouts and it won't stay healthy. So it was really important for us to bring this back to Hopi so that people could use it in the ways that are culturally appropriate uh, at Hopi. But it was at these two meetings where we met with the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office and together asked the question of what should we do next as a part of the Pueblo Farming Project. And together we came up with this idea for the Maze Database Project, which the central feature of this project, again, it has many different dimensions, is developing a comprehensive database of here we say archaeological maze, but it turns out that it's been both archaeological and ethnographic collections uh, for Colorado in the greater Southwest. And, uh, you know, it, it's a really important project from Crow Canyon because it's, it's not Hopi consulting on this project, it's Hopi really taking the lead on developing it. Um, so it has a lot of different goals, but uh, the primary one is to develop this uh, comprehensive database that will enable scholars and native communities to know about the maze, the Southwest maze that is in all these different uh, repositories. And we think that it will also provide a really important research for developing educational curricula on the history and importance of maize one of the most important crops in the world today. Um, we'll also try and work with the ancient maize map that uh, Michael Blake has created uh, to uh, inventory the C14 dated samples of maize in these collections and add them to that uh, in that ancient days maize map, which has dates of maize that from other parts of uh, the world, this greater Southwest and Mesoamerica and beyond that Michael Blake has uh, built. So here's our maze database uh, team on the left at our opening meeting. Um, uh, Susan Sekoptewa on the left, Paul Ermagiotti, Kyle Basinski, Sarah Oas, Stuart, Kelly Schwartz, myself, and uh, Jessica Lomatewama. Um, we met to discuss the project and outline our goals, further specify our beginning goals. And also to follow up that opening meeting, we started doing regional museum visits. So uh, we had gotten inventories from three of the most important repositories and museums in the Four Corners, um, thanks to their curators. And we're really grateful to these folks because they all have really demanding jobs and we're asking them to do one more thing. So Canyons of the Ancients Visitor Center and Museum located just outside of Dolores, Colorado. Uh, Tracy Murphy and Bridget Ambler helped us there. 
Edge of the Cedars State Park and Museum in Blanding, Utah. Jonathan Till uh, was our go-to person there and the Mesa Verde Visitor and Research Center where Terrace Tra Tara Travis was the uh, curator who helped us with those collections. Um, so visiting the museum collections was um, just really profound. It, you know, it's one thing to get a spreadsheet and see all the hundreds and sometimes thousands of accessions individual accessions of maize samples that have been brought into those repositories, but it's obviously far more important and far more um, increases your knowledge by actually seeing uh, the specimens. It was also important for our team to meet with the curators to see how they store and handle these materials and to learn from them their protocols for how researchers or native communities could access these uh, collections for their uses. So in this next really short video, uh, Stuart Koyayamptiwa is gonna reflect on, um, on what how visiting these collections affected him. My visit collection, I was just so, it's an honor, you know, to see I looked in there and in your tablets, you, you know, these things may have been made by our ancestors, you know. My visit collection. So um, it really is an honor, and it was really profound to uh, see these samples. Um, the uh, accession information we receive as a spreadsheet and the inventories we receive really vary from museum to museum. We had asked for a, a particular format uh, for uh, the inventories and some museums were able to comply because they had all that information and uh, but other museums just don't have the ability to do that their uh, records aren't computerized and uh, they have uh, uh, not as much information on each individual sample but they did give us the number of accessions that they have and that they do have corn uh, in those accessions so in addition when the material is accession uh, the level of description that comes with it really varies from some that just says corn to others that really specify the plant parts, uh, how many, uh, how many uh, samples are in each accession, uh, et cetera. Um, we were particularly interested in uh, the state of preservation of the samples and things like whether uh, the samples were burned or unburned, whole or fragmentary. Uh, we wanted to know the particular part of the corn plant that was represented. Sometimes it was cobs or kernels, but it was also all the other parts of the corn plant are present in collections as well. And we also wanted to know if the uh, maize was accessioned and found with other artifacts, uh, including other botanical rem uh, remains like other kinds of seeds or, or crop seeds or other artifacts. Um, and uh, we were interested in whether the corn had been modified in any way and turned into artifacts. And we did see uh, many uh, examples of that. And I'll talk about some of those uh, later. As I mentioned, um, one of the things we learned uh, was how these repositories package and curate the materials. And as you can see, this includes many techniques for how to handle the samples and uh, techniques for storing them to ensure their uh, long-term preservation. We also learned about the different types of storage systems at each facility. And you can see how they range uh, uh, at the three different facilities that we visited there. I would say that um, I think everyone on our Mays database team really came away impressed by how these three facilities and their curators take care of these materials and their dedication to the long-term preservation uh, of these collections. It's, it's really impressive uh, how dedicated they are to that task. So there's Partly, as we're visiting the collections, we're also having discussions, both with the curators and among our group, 
about the different types of analysis that researchers do uh, on maize. And that includes uh, looking at the ancient DNA and genetics of maize, paleoethnobotanical work that actually analyzes the samples themselves for things like kernel and cob morphology, trying to determine land races. It's a bit of a problematic term or concept. Uh, the endosperm type, uh, pollen analysis, phytoliths, um, dating of maize is, is really important in uh, Southwest archaeology and isotopic studies of maize. So one of the maybe the most common types of analysis is the analysis of the maize macrofossils or the corn macrofossils itself, which could be cobs, kernels, or any of the other uh, corn parts. And that's done by a scholar who we call a paleoethnobotanist and the paleoethnobotanist on our team is Sarah Ose, who's shown on this slide. And I'm proud to say that Sarah was a former Crow Canyon intern. She studied ethnobotany at Crow Canyon with Karen Adams, one of the leaders in the field, uh, and recently uh, completed her award-winning dissertation. She won the best dissertation prize uh, given by the Society for American Archaeology for her uh, dissertation work, which focused on plant use uh, at Zuni. So it was really uh, important to have Sarah as a part of our team. Um, we also, um, oh, so this next slide is a video. And in it, Susan is going to, I think it's Susan, and oh, both Jessica and Susan are going to reflect on this sort of interaction that we had as we looked at these uh, maize specimens at the facilities. Gone to museums and into some of their collections and seen this, but it's like, you know, oh, but now, you know, with experts, it's like a new eyes. Mm -hmm. um, now when I go somewhere, it's like, oh, I know what this is, you know. So that's, for me, that's an, an eye-opener as well. Everything, you know, I'm learning the dented and the, all the different, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this experience today is, is just the conversations this morning are recognizing this, the STEM education possibilities mm -hmm. of science right. in our own culture and we don't look at corn this way but it's I'm beginning to see the value of that. Uh, as Jessica said earlier I'm going to go back to my collections and count them. I mean I don't know if counting the rows is really something but it's just a diff another way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about maturity of the corn by picking off mm -hmm. the ends and looking at the black pieces. I, I, I know what you're talking about but I'm going to go look at it again. Mm -hmm. Um, just looking at our corn more more intently and directly than I ever have before. And I think that can lead us to more appreciation for what we have, because when you do it every day, all day, every, you know, just there, you, you, you do take it for granted. That is kind of going to be And I think our community can look at this as something we just always did, and it's, it's not that big of a deal. Gone to museums. Uh, so, in addition to the paleoethnobotanical analysis, we studied genetic analysis, and we had one of the foremost leaders in the world on the genetic analysis of corn as a part of our team, Kelly Schwartz, who's pictured here. Um, Kelly uh, did a dissertation that looked, was a comprehensive DNA analysis of southwestern maize. Uh, she currently works in uh, Europe, continuing her genetic studies. Um, and it's also Kelly who did uh, most of the Pueblo farming project analysis of the modern Hopi maize. Um, so this was a really important discussion for us to have. We talked about uh, the importance of maize for radiocarbon dating, really important because it's an annual. So you're just dating the year that that particular sample was uh, alive. Uh, and I would say since I started in Southwest archaeology, uh, when I began, we did very few C14 dates of maize because it was more expensive and it was less precise than uh, tree ring dating and often less precise than we could date context with pottery. 
but that's really changed over the years, especially with uh, uh, accelerator mass spectrometry or AMS radiocarbon dating, uh, partly because it requires a much smaller sample, uh, takes less time, and produces the highest precision, so that we're now getting really uh, much more precise dating, and so it's it's much really important to Southwest uh, archaeology today. Finally, we discussed uh, isot what can be learned through isotopic analyses. Uh, we didn't have an expert here on the team, although uh, we have been uh, informed by this by another Crow Canyon intern who's gone on to be uh, uh, get his uh, PhD, Reuven Saninsky. And um, there's just lots of things you can learn, including the environmental conditions that were present where and when the plant grew, answers to questions about the origin and spread of maize, and studies of how important maize was in ancestral Pueblo people's diet. Uh, so now, um, getting sort of towards the end, but I wanted to just show you some of these uh, amazing examples. Um, and uh, here you can see on the left, a whole ear uh, still in the husk. On the right, there's another ear in the husk, but this one has been bound with a uh, yucca cordage. Um, and then there's that whole ear in the middle, which I've blown these up to make the windows the same size, but this was actually a really small ear. And it's kind of hard to see from this uh, photo, but I really wish uh, Stuart uh, was here presenting instead of me, because he could really talk about the importance of these kind of small ears uh, better than I can. But I do know from working with Hopi folks on the Pueblo farming project that these ears where the kernels come all the way up to the tip are particularly important uh, for much more than food and for Hopi cultural and ceremonial life. I believe you get one of these ears when you're born, that it's an important part of various rites throughout your life all the way up uh, to the time you die. And I, I do think this is maybe the kind that they call the mother ear. I'm not, I may have that wrong. Again, I wish uh, Stuart, a real expert, uh, could talk about this. But I do have a video of Stuart where he does um, talk about something similar to this. So I'll play that video. When we first got to this area, that there was different types of corn laid out, and each group chose um, the different varieties. And the the Hopi people were was the ones that were the last to pick, and that was just a small, you know, corn. And um, but that corn that the last one that was a corn that was the, the main mother of all corn when we first so you can see how from that clip how hopi and th this is true for all the pueblos really see the origins of their societies and their cultures as tied to their relationship to corn and to them beginning to be corn farmers um, so you really, it's hard to find something that's uh, more important to Pueblo people than corn. Uh, here you see some more uh, incredible artifacts. On the left is a corn husk that's been bound, and there was actually several, we didn't open it obviously, but you can see that you can look into it, and there's several chert flakes inside of that. In the middle is a special stick where they've taken uh, some corn husks and tied those to the top of the stick. And those on the far right actually had holes drilled in the peduncle, the, the base of the uh, cob, uh, so that they could be strung with a uh, yucca cordage and hung to dry. Um, Edge of the Cedars Museum is phenomenal. And uh, once again, props to Jonathan Till, who's also phenomenal both as a curator and as a research archeologist, but they had a few examples where people had found pottery vessels that had corn seed, sometimes mixed with a few other seeds inside. And this is a beautiful photograph by uh, Reed and Paul of those artifacts. Um, there was an amazing group of cobs tied together also with feathers tied on. Then on the right is a husk that's been tied into a knot. And in the middle are some of the corn seed 
along with the beans and a few squash seeds that were from that vessel that I showed in the previous slide. One of the most interesting artifacts that we saw was something that we call cob on a stick or sometimes on a quill. Um, and what's interesting is they were present in the collections of all three of the museums uh, that we visited. And I think this is an, this is an example of um, how the Hopi experts are so critical uh, to this project because we could speculate forever and throw out interpretations of what these are used for, but Hopi and other Pueblo people actually have experiences with these. So I'm gonna play a visit a video with uh, Jessica talking about her knowledge of these. Can you mention the observations you made about the cobs on a stick? Um, well, with this one, I first saw this one, it um, reminded me there's a, a dart game and it's also used in a women's society uh, as, as part of their um, thing. And then and as I looked at this one closer, it's totally different. Um, while, while this one, the, the point is at, at the tip of the, the cob and while the stick on this one is at the thick part. Mm -hmm. So this one is used for something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, I've never seen one of these like this. So mm -hmm. That's something new for me anyway. You mentioned um, those artifacts are really interesting. And after this museum visit, I actually found a old late 1800s or early 1900s, I can't remember, publication by Matilda Cox Stevenson, where she illustrated these at Zuni and described uh, this dark game that uh, Jessica was talking about. And one thing that's amazing is uh, they were from, they were in all three of the museums that we visited, but um, you can see from this slide that we actually obtained uh, uh, inventories so far from 39 repositories and they're present in virtually those that cob on the stick artifact is present in virtually every one of the large uh, collections uh, not always there in collections that aren't as large and they're present in collections from they came from sites in southern Arizona and maybe northern Mexico I'd have to go back and check uh, all the way up to northern Colorado and northern Utah and they've been found in sites in far west Texas, near Marfa, Texas, in rock shelters from that area uh, on the east and all the way to western Nevada and maybe even uh, parts of California uh, on the west. So it really surprised me how widespread these are. And it would be really interesting to know uh, the time depth uh, on that artifact too. Well, I'm wrapping up here, and uh, these are some uh, numbers on what we've done to create this database. So far, we've contacted 73 repositories. Um, um, that effort got somewhat stalled by COVID, but I'm getting back into it now. Uh, so far, 39 uh, have provided uh, data on their collections. And once again, we're contacting these folks. They're often places that are underfunded and maybe understaffed and they have more to do than they have time to do and we're asking them to do one more thing and yet they were gracious enough to uh, you know give us their inventories um, so really really grateful to those 39 uh, repositories uh, at those 39 of the 39 inventories we have there's a total of about 16,500 uh, individual accessions. Most of those accessions, some of them are individual specimens, but most of them contain multiple specimens. Uh, and sometimes there'll be a bag of 100 cobs in one accession. Uh, so we estimate there's well over 100,000 individual samples of maize uh, at these repositories and that are represented in the maize database that we're pulling together. Um, the samples include maize from when from sites that are the earliest known maize in the Southwest, all the way up to ethnographic collections of indigenous maize from throughout the Southwest that were made in the middle 1900s. And uh, once again, like the cobs on a stick artifact, they come from everywhere from Northern Mexico to Northern Utah and Colorado, and from West Texas to Western Nevada. 
Um, so we have uh, work to do to complete. Uh, that includes contacting uh, a few remaining museums and going back to ones that uh, we lost touch with during uh, the pandemic. Uh, we would like to visit uh, museums in the Denver Boulder area. We'd actually already bought our airplane tickets to do this in uh, February of uh, 2020 and then um, just became impossible to get on that airplane and travel because of COVID. So we hope to still do that. And if we can't do it in person, uh, maybe figure out how to do it virtually. Um, we want to create an inventory of the dated samples. Um, and most important, we want to hold a closing meeting, which uh, it would be really nice to do it at Crow Canyon because we could invite uh, farmers from uh, other Pueblos to sit in and listen about what we've done. But it may be easier to do it in Hopi. We need, I need to reconvene the team and to discuss that. And what we'll do is uh, complete, we'll hold that meeting after we complete the maze database something that we hope to do in the first half of 2022. Um, and we will discuss that database and develop a research and education plan for uh, future work with that maze. So I've got a couple more visit, uh, videos to end this talk. I think the first one is Susan talking and then Stuart after that. And uh, I'm ending with these because they sort of point towards the kinds of questions that they have and the kinds of opportunities that they see for their communities uh, in terms of working with this database. So here is uh, Susan, I think. But I think reconnecting to how old, we know it's old, but we're now being able to put numbers and see the science behind it. It's, it does begin to show that continuity in a real, real way. And, um, that's what I'm beginning to gather out of some of this. And the sea corn, it's just, I, I love that piece, that, that nugget. <laughs> There's a sense of hope because of this history, because of, because of what we've endured. And, and, and the older people know that, the younger ones, I'm not so sure. And that's what I think, how we can utilize these collections for our young community to help understand that and really grasp it to another way. <laughs> So it was interesting in an earlier video, Susan also mentioned the opportunities for STEM uh, um, uh, education at Hopi uh, about maize to connect with the younger people as she mentioned in this video. So here's Stuart. My primary interest in this project is the movement from this area to Hopi mesas. You know, that's my major major emphasis in trying to find out. We hear the stories, we hear the clan stories, but I guess I'm really trying to get the more hard evidence of where these stories, I mean, where the movement of these corns, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. The reason I picked um, Jessica, and, and I'm glad that Susan were part of the same clan free tree the badger and butterfly, which we come from here. Mm -hmm. Our people, our stories. So um, I wanted to bring people up here that have some sort of connection and mm -hmm. we don't come from anywhere else. Our stories don't come with me. We're here, we're, we never migrated from like Mesoamerica, like other Hopi clans. Mm -hmm. So that's my primary interest is the, the movement, just the small movement from from Hopi, from here to Hopi. So we'll meet at that closing meeting and continue these conversations about how uh, the maze database, um, how we move forward with that and uh, the benefits that that can have for Hopi and other Pueblo communities, as well as all humanity, because this corn really is uh, one of the world's most important crops and people uh, need to know more about its history. So I want to thank everybody who tuned in to the webinar. Um, and once again, I want to thank History Colorado State Historical Fund for enabling us to do this project. So I am going to stop my screen share uh, because that's the end of my talk. Hello. Mark, thank you very much. Um, that, that was 
a great overview of the project you're doing and some of the results that you're, you're, you're beginning to get. We do, in fact, have a couple of questions if you're willing to take some. Of course. Of course. So one theme that came up a, a couple of times is gender. Uh, most of the uh, folks who have provided information on the actual farming practices have been male members of Hopi and other Pueblos. Um, but a lot of the interlocutors that we were seeing in some of those consultations on collections were, were women. So what's the dynamic with male and female roles as they relate to, to maize and how you've negotiated that in the course of this project? Well, thanks, Kellen. And thanks for whoever asked that question. Uh, when, when we started the maize database uh, project, I specifically asked Stuart that we include women because the Pueblo Farming Project, which focused on planting and harvesting, traditionally that's more of a male activity, but after it's harvested, the corn becomes the domain of women. And so they're the ones who decide and tell the men what varieties to plant in their fields, um, et cetera. And of course, who are nurturing the maize and taking care of it and using it once it's harvested. Uh, so a big part of this project that is still ongoing is to have Susan and Jessica and potentially others at uh, Women at Hopi uh, provide more content for understanding women's role in maize and maize farming. So that's still in progress too, but that's that was uh, a specific goal of this project. Oh, well, thanks for, for clarifying. I know that's been on, it was more than one person who, who was curious about that. Um, I'm looking through the Q&A here really quick as well. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, maize DNA uh, and, and looking at the differences between different varieties of maize, just how big are the genetic differences between uh, say modern corn and some of the Hopi maize varieties and then thinking a little bit about how those maize varieties change uh, and whether there's any issues with contamination. I know that's been a major concern for a lot of traditional societies that have food crops. Um, they, they do not want them to somehow become patented and taken over by a major corporation. They don't necessarily want them to become blended with those corporations. So I'm sorry, it's kind of a long two-part question, but can you address the, the genetic aspects of that a little bit? Differences between the modern and the Hopi varieties, which I suppose are modern, it's still Hopi corn if you're growing it at Hopi. Um, and then issues with potential contamination or concerns over uh, you know, people getting a hold of these varieties. Yeah, um, great question. Um, and it's too bad we didn't have Kelly here because she's an expert and I'm not. Uh, but I can tell you that, um, let me go back and talk about uh, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office wanting to do this document, the DNA of modern uh, Hopi corn, because they believe that they've done a really good job of maintaining the integrity of that. But they recognize in the modern world, they don't know about the threats of genetically modified corn and other things creeping into their and mixing with their corn. So they worry about that. And they wanted to get this baseline uh, of that corn. Um, and when we did that project, an important thing to note is that they really want, they wanted, they control those data. So we did the study and we gave it to the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office and anybody who would want to work with those data would have to go through the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office. So I probably can't talk too much about that study, but in general, things that were really interesting uh, were that were really interesting. Um, Kelly were could that compare it to the study she did Kelly for her dissertation. Compare it to the study she did for her dissertation. I'm getting an echo, Kellum. I'm not sure if somebody needs to echo, move. Kellum, I'm not sure if. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, um, for her dissertation, she looked at all varieties of Southwestern maize from a lot of different groups, Pueblo and beyond. And um, she mostly used the samples that were collected and curated by the USDA and that they continue to grow out each year to preserve those varieties. 
Um, so working with the Hopi corn that we got, we got it from modern Hopi farmers and we got 13 different varieties and I think is what we did. And so that was really different than working with this stuff that's, you know, uh, periodically grown out by the USDA and I believe watered and things like that. Um, so uh, one of the general things she found when she looked at the modern samples that the Hopi farmers gave us was that Hopi corn really is distinct from other corn and the different varieties of the different colors of corn, the 13 varieties are distinct from each other. There's real differences. It's not just morphological, you know, it's not just the color isn't, uh, there's real genetic variability there. And I think the, gen, the maize geneticists that have looked at these indigenous corns, that's one of the things they're most struck by is how indigenous groups have preserved such diversity compared to our modern uh, hybrids. Um, another interesting thing that came out of that study is that the, uh, the modern Hopi corn was different than the USDA curated corn. And so you gotta wonder, you know, the, uh, how the, the maintenance of the corn in the fields at Hopi has created what is Hopi corn today. And uh, they're really working hard at, uh, trying to continue the preservation of those varieties. So I'm not sure that answers your question very well, but. Um. So I'm not sure that answers you. Oh, I think it touched on several of the, of the themes that, that folks were hoping to hear about. And I guess for me, it also just highlights the, the real plasticity of maize as a species in that it, uh, you know, th these varieties that are they are kept so separate, even though they're being grown within such a small area. And in addition, that they can change so dramatically over the course of just a couple of generations if the USDA curated varieties are showing these differences uh, over time. Yeah, Kellum, I'm glad you uh, made that comment because um, the study that Kelly did with, I don't know, is one of those papers in science that had uh, many, many authors, although Kelly was the lead author. They looked at maize that had been recovered from uh, the earliest period of maize in the Four Corners, what we call the Basket Maker II period, that I believe came from a site in Grand Gulch, and uh, studied that maize and documented the genetic changes that had occurred in that maize that differentiated it from maize that came from further south and the changes from the maize from further south, it's a more tropical environment to maize being grown in the four corners and on the Colorado plateau where there's um, shorter growing seasons and less precipitation. So I believe that study also makes the same point that you just made about maize as a crop is really quickly can apparently really quickly uh, change to adapt to those local conditions. And further studies like that I think are gonna be really important to us understanding the uh, spread of maize uh, throughout the Southwest. I wanted to return, well, well first of all, just a real quick question. Um, Kelly's full name is, is, it's Dr. Kelly Schwartz, correct? Yes. Uh -huh. And do you remember when and where Kelly got her dissertation or got her uh, PhD where she did her dissertation? June Sinceri was just really curious to look that up, I think. Well, I'm going to get this wrong, June, but I think it's Columbia. That sounds right to me, too. That's what's in my head. Yeah, they have a. Uh, and then a follow-up question on that that June had was uh, about the intellectual property rights. You touched on this a little bit, but I actually think it's a really fascinating question because we often think of, uh, you know, we talk a lot about collections, curation, who gets to control objects of cultural patrimony, but the actual knowledge about the maze, the genetic results that we've been discussing, you mentioned that some of these things are housed with Hopi CPO, and they don't go any further than that without express permission of the Hopi. Uh, what are some of the things that you've encountered working on this project in terms of intellectual property rights? Well, we just always defer to Hopi on anything. You know, we would never, uh, pub they're co-authors on everything we have published, but we wouldn't move forward with anything without uh, working with them. And I do think they, 
they probably wouldn't use the term intellectual property rights, but I do think they see this as their intellectual property and um, uh, something they want to uh, both be acknowledged for and protect. And there have been preliminary discussions about actually doing something about that. Um, and I'm not an expert enough to know the degree that modern agriculture has already gone past that and, you know, appropriated things out of indigenous corn and I suppose other crops too, but in this case, we're talking about corn uh, in order to develop the new varieties that are marketed for uh, mass corn agriculture today. Uh, but um, I have had, anyway, I think that's another topic that Hopi will want to continue to discuss and that the other Pueblos too, you know, because other Pueblos have their distinct varieties and the other Pueblos, uh, Zuni, Acoma, Laguna and the Rio Grande Pueblos all have people within those uh, their uh, nations who are actively working to curate and preserve their traditional varieties. So I think that's going to be an important topic for them moving forward. Thanks, Mark. I've got a couple quick nuts and bolts questions, or maybe it's more like I don't know, kernels and husk questions. Um, are there, what are the major differences between these row varieties where you've got eight, 10, 12 rows? What does that signify on a maize cob? Well, I need, uh, as Susan said, they don't count rows, you know? I mean, they would notice, but that's not as important to them. But uh, Paul, who's really the master farmer from the Crow Canyon side of this project and Reed and Grant too, uh, the three of them, uh, we do count that. That's part of what we record. And in any given field, uh, even within any given clump, there'll be a variety from eight to, I think the most we've ever had is 24. It might be 26. So there's incredible uh, variety. And um, I think my answer is that we don't fully understand what creates that variety. Um, but I, Paul, if he were on, he had to, he had a teaching gig today, so he couldn't join me, but uh, he would be able to give a better answer than me to that. And there might be some of that in the ebook. Um, so I apologize, I can't do better, except to say that, that it's incredible, the variation in, in things like, and size, you know, we just uh, harvested uh, last week and our best garden is the one that Grant's father let us put in the middle of one of his, uh, fields. And I mean, there, you know, you think about, because when you visit sites, you only see, often you'll see corn cobs and they're really small, but that's not true at Hopi. When we go help them with harvests and planting and things, um, they get really big ears and we get really big ears. We get small ears too, but we get mostly uh, really big ears. And we have some from this year's harvest from Mike's field that God, they must be 16 inches long. They're just really huge. Uh, and they're long and slender. So the variety is really, really interesting. And, you know, we um, each field has a separate variety because uh, the Hopi told us not to mix them and keep different varieties in different gardens. But so you'll have a field like uh, the, Mike, the Mike Coffee Garden is blue corn. But every once in a while, even though we planted blue seeds, a white ear will come out of that uh, field. So there's, it's just really endlessly fascinating the variety and the different expressions of these plants uh, that come from this. And Paul being the expert uh, could speak a lot better than that to me. And I encourage you to check out the ebook to learn more on that. Do those varieties get used for different things at Hopi? Uh, what, what are the purposes of these different varieties? Definitely. And um, that's another one that I really can't speak to and wish that I had a Hopi colleague on with me today. Uh, but they too are just swamped with work and couldn't join me. And uh, so we use the videos instead. They have, uh, they have different uh, uses, both when they're used for food 
and the different dishes that are cooked. So in terms of cuisine, um, and um, but they also have different uses in the ceremonial and uh, cultural life. So for example, certain colors of certain varieties are associated with the four directions. Uh, certain colors and certain varieties are used in different ways at ceremonies. Uh, so um, I don't have all that specific cultural knowledge except to say uh, that's the case. And I think it's getting harder to, you know, I, like there one farmer with all the farmers we worked with we came up with 13 varieties when we did the dna analysis but i don't think there's many as many folks planting that great of a diversity so i think that's a big question going forward too is uh not just maintaining that diversity at a place like the usda but maintaining it at hopi itself and i wish uh stewart or uh, some of the other Hopi experts were here to talk to that point, but I think it's a real concern for the Pueblos uh, moving forward. Something that they're dedicated to trying to do, but that the modern world presents real challenges to. I would also say, Kellen, I have that, a couple um, specific questions about collecting. Sorry, um, stepping on you. Um, they also have they also talk about the different characteristics of the varieties in terms of which ones the length of the growing season varies by variety that is needed uh, the the amount of water the amount of soil moisture uh, so they have those kind of characteristics that the farmers are well aware of too um, and then the women who prepare the corn have a really intimate knowledge of the characteristics of it in different kinds of cuisine uh, preparation. And I think that's something that uh, we totally underappreciate. We might think, you know, you just eat corn and you just, you know, fix a cob of corn and eat it. And it's not that way in the Pueblos. There's all these amazingly subtle and different dishes uh, that are prepared that uh, use different varieties in different ways. So really interesting and delicious. You'd mentioned earlier about the, the what a perceived difference in the size of maize cobs recovered archaeologically and the things that are being grown by the Pueblo Farming Project now and the things that we know are being grown at Hopi and other Pueblos. Um, didn't Karen Adams have a study that was looking at cob shrinkage and, and, and what can you say about that? You know, Karen and her colleagues, uh, including Deb Munchrath and others, uh, have done so many different studies. So, and I think Dylan Schwint actually helped with that shrinkage one, shrinkage through burning, uh, looking at what happens when they get charred, because a lot of the material we find is charred and not uncharred. Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the details of that study, but uh, Karen and uh, Deb and others did a really important study where they planted, um, all the different Southwest varieties and tended them in the same way to measure the morphological and growth, reproductive growth uh, stages of all of those crops. So that's called the maize. I forget the name of that publication, but if somebody was interested and wanted to know, they could email Paul or I and we could come up with that. But that's another important study. And um, Karen has done more. Too. And I think she and Sarah Ose actually have a new article that's getting ready to come out in American Antiquity that has uh, something to do with the different varieties in the germoplasm, I believe, but I don't really know the specifics of that either. Is there a good way to get in contact with you if people do have questions about, about things like that? Or where is what's a good resource? How can, how can people find out more about these? topics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is the ebook one of the best places to go? Yeah. Yeah, the ebook is definitely where I would start. And uh, but I think both Paul and I and Grant, uh, we would all uh, take uh, questions. Ben really knows a lot about this too because of his MA work um, during the Animus La Plata project where he had experimental fields. Um, and um, my all of our emails here at Crow Canyon are the first initial of our first name and then our last name. 
at crowcanyon.org. So uh, you can, Taylor can help uh, provide contacts with us too, but happy to take emails and to the best of my ability, answer questions, which will probably mean forwarding the email to Paul. Oh, I'm sure he's going to appreciate that, but I did notice he has a smartphone now, so he's a lot easier to track down. Um, well, I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up, and, and I think that question is going to be, uh, this is an incredible project, and it has taught us so much about farming in the Pueblo world and the factors that influence the development and growth of maize. Uh, is it going to be extended in any way? Is it going to be extended beyond Hopi to other tribal communities? Are we going to look into trying out different kinds of farming practices, maybe floodwater farming as opposed to direct precipitation? Where do you plan to go next? Well, I think that's uh, all to be discussed. I would, um, you know, it's gonna take an effort by a bigger group of people, but I hope we can continue this because as I said in the beginning of this talk, the impetus for studying corn and corn farming is Pueblo people telling us that that's what they're interested in and that's what they would like to work together with archaeologists and scholars on. So, and just at our last um, uh, uh, meeting that we had here at Crow Canyon with our uh, native advisors, they brought that up again. And uh, the point of that was to uh, work with more of the other Pueblo groups. So we would definitely like to do that. Uh, those discussions will be a part of the closing meeting of the Maze uh, database project about how we move forward and how we create uh, more partners. Uh, if that's the way to go, which I think everybody would probably be amenable to that. So uh, all of that is open to discussion. Uh, here at Crow Canyon, we've also, um, we did a project called the Village Ecodynamics Project, which was the one that did the computer modeling of maize yields and how those changed for every spot on the landscape in southwestern Colorado, um, uh, depending on how the climate changed each year. And uh, we'd like to extend that into southeastern Utah. But as you move in that direction, uh, the soils are different and it's drier and lower elevations and almost certainly there uh, they probably had to not do as much dry land farming and more farming where they did irrigation from rainfall and um, then I'll just add at the end you've been somebody who's wanted to extend this into your project at Haney so I'll let you talk about that for a second. Uh, well, and that's why I, I put that prompt in there is that we are beginning to wonder whether some sites in the Mesa Verde region uh, used different kinds of farming methods uh, aside from direct precipitation rainfall, aside from just the rain that comes out of the sky. Uh, and it does seem to potentially be a factor in some of the sites from the late Pueblo I, early Pueblo II period around here, um, places located down along the floodplain. And it, it, I, I feel like it's an open question to, uh, once again, what are the different factors that are involved in that? What times of year do you really need water to be available? What kinds of soils are most amenable? Um, of course, there's a lot of challenges, I imagine, with trying to do an experimental project that uh, involves floodwater farming, because uh, one of the key things, at least with US water law, is that while the stuff that falls from the sky is exactly free, but can be in Southwest Colorado, if you want to try to practice this and try it, you need to have water shares, um, which is a whole other uh, ball of wax. So at any rate, Mark, now I'm, I'm really excited about the prospect of maybe trying to think about other farming techniques or other, other ways of bringing water to crops and to see what that looks like if we figure out ways to model it and extend some of these projects that have already been ongoing. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of, fertile ground there for exploration. Um, yeah, and you know, when there, we can map out the soils that would have been best for dry farming and the soils that wouldn't have been as good. And there's lots of sites in the Mesa Verde region that were on soils that weren't as good. So for example, the project that the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe did 
on the southern Piedmont of Ute Mountain, um, there's no way I think you could do dry farming there. And they had researchers on that project that really studied in detail how uh, floodwater irrigation uh, would have been the key to those communities living in that area. And I think that applies to other parts. So to fully understand uh, the, the Pueblo occupation of this region, we have to expand beyond dry farming. So uh, I guess we're gonna get a garden going out somewhere by Haney maybe. You know, That'd be um, amazing if we could. I think our, our, our... William Doolittle, who I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, studied floodwater farming at modern communities in Mexico. So some of the best uh, uh, publications on that are work that he did. Uh, I, I'm just jotting that down to make sure I remember. Uh, yeah, yeah his name and also to go and take a look at some of those reports from the uh, the U Mountain Piedmont from that, that big project down there. Right. Um, well, I think that brings us about up to what we've got time-wise for the webinar today. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Mark, for uh, sharing what you know and your involvement in this project. Thank you to the folks at Hopi and the other Pueblos who have contributed to this project. Um, and I imagine thank you to all of the repositories and places where these maize samples are stored for getting back to, to Mark and the project team. And uh, this is really amazing work, um, really incredible stuff at the core of, it's a place where all the core aspects of Crow Canyon's mission intersect in one spot. It, it's such a cool thing you're all doing. So just a reminder to everybody out there that we do have a couple of great webinars coming up in the next couple of weeks. Once again, Winona LaDuke will be here uh, coming up next, uh, speaking about indigenous knowledge and how it can help with the transition from fossil fuels. Uh, and then Ricardo Cate speaking about art and activism in his work as one of the leading uh, cartoonists and satirists uh, in New Mexico. So once again, Mark, thank you very much. Taylor, thank you for facilitating as well. Um, once again, I'm Kellum Throgmorton. I hope you all have a good rest of your afternoon and evening, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Callum, and thank you to everybody who tuned in. Appreciate it.